Chapter Twenty of Peggy Raymond's School Days, or Old Girls and New, by Harriet Lemmis Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty, Commencement. In spite of the multiplied obstacles with which she had contended during her senior year, Victoria Wells led her class. The announcement made at the assembly one morning was greeted with hearty applause by the seniors. Victoria, who still wore a shade over her eyes much of the time, pulled it down to her nose, that no one might see the tears trembling on her lashes. Victoria had always been an ambitious girl. She had planned to graduate at the head of her class from the day she had entered as freshman, and that was no surprise. What she had not anticipated was that her classmates' generous applause should mean more to her than the honor itself. But though Victoria led her class, it was out of the question for her to make the valedictory address. The doctors vetoed the suggestion peremptorily, and the faculty, after duly considering the case, decided that the class president was the most suitable person to act as Victoria's representative. Blanche received the announcement without any indication of satisfaction. As a matter of fact, she turned pale. "'Oh, I'm not the one,' cried Blanche. "'What can they be thinking of? It ought to be Peggy Raymond.' "'Not on your life!' exclaimed Peggy, who did not often drop into slang but felt that the occasion warranted forcible language she compressed her lips in a manner implying that nothing could budge her from her decision peggy was still a little sensitive over unearned honors but a new complication arose when the class met to award the scholarship as it was invariably bestowed on the valedictorian the vote was a mere matter of form and the girls came listlessly to do what was expected of them and get away as soon as possible but hardly had the meeting been called to order when victoria wells was on her feet miss president whatever victoria's abilities speech-making was not her forte she squirmed uneasily her shaking voice betraying that even the addressing of her classmates was an ordeal i know it is customary to vote this scholarship to the one who who happens to get first honors and i just want to say to say i don't want it the room hushed to a stillness where every girl could hear the sound of her own tense breathing victoria stammered on i'm not going to college for a year or two anyway the doctors think i need rest and when i'm ready i'm going to a college out west where my aunt lives she took her seat and a more eloquent orator might have been satisfied with the effort of that brief address for the restless assembly had become animated and alert the girls were exchanging significant glances here and there heads met as whispers went back and forth the slips of paper were distributed and tellers appointed the scratching of the girls pencils writing the name of their candidates was the only sound in the room in silence the ballots were collected peggy looking about on her classmates wondered at the preternatural solemnity of the faces it's going to make trouble i'm afraid said peggy to herself victoria's not wanting that scholarship suppose two girls get nearly the same vote on the first ballot then the one that loses is bound to be disappointed the meeting will come to order please said blanche rapping nervously on the table the tellers are ready to announce the result of the first ballot the call to order was a matter of form for the buzz of whispering which filled the room had died down into absolute quiet as marian o'neill came forward marian's voice betrayed her excitement as she began reading whole number of votes cast a hundred and eight margaret raymond received ninety-nine the class did not wait for marian to finish instantly the room was in an uproar the storm of hand-clapping was as spontaneous as the vote itself peggy who had started up with a wild idea of protesting sank back into her seat her heart pounding why this meant college peggy's plan had been to teach somewhere in the country for a year or two raising a little money against the expenses of college life the spirit of independence, which distinguishes the American girl from all others, made her reluctant to continue a dead weight on her father's small income. But now this wonderful, unexpected good fortune, falling like a bolt from the blue sky, had brought the goal of her ambition very near. Next fall her college life could begin. She looked about on her applauding classmates, and did not know that her cheeks were wet. Not a name had been spoken, and yet with no concerted plan ninety-nine girls out of one hundred and eight had voted for her even peggy's sensitive pride could find no ground for hesitation she was their choice and the gift which meant so much in her life came enriched by the love and good will of these associates peggy had had her share of little triumphs in her eighteen active years 
but there was no denying the fact that this was the big moment of her life speech somebody shouted and then others took it up speech speech peggy raymond peggy rose to her feet promptly as a rule she was ready enough but as the applause died down and expectant faces turned toward her she suddenly knew that words could not do the subject justice you know i never dreamed of this the unaccustomed tremor in peggy's voice bore out her statement you've just taken my breath away and i feel as if i'd been struck by lightning oh girls she flung out her arms with a gesture as if she wanted to hug them all you're the dearest things that ever happened and i don't know how to thank you but it was not the evidences of good will from peggy's classmates alone which brightened the closing days of her school life as commencement approached all sorts of remembrances came from all sorts of people among them was one of those ornate books that refuse to adjust themselves to the capacity of the bookcase shelves and are inconvenient for reading so that the whole sphere of usefulness left is to display themselves on the centre table but the inscription on the fly-leaf endeared the volume to peggy's heart for it read to peggy raymond from her affectionate friend genevieve when the sophomores entertained the seniors according to the time-honoured custom Addie Dwight and Genevieve Alden were both on the committee of arrangements, and Peggy noticed, with satisfaction, that Addie's manner was conciliating, and Genevieve's courteous. Peggy dared to hope that by the time the two girls reached their senior year, they would have become friends. Kitty Fox and Estelle Burdick brought her a joint offering, a dresser set, the work of their own hands, and designed with due regard for the color scheme of Peggy's room the growing intimacy between these two freshmen was a source of great satisfaction to peggy straightforward kitty was bound to exert a good influence on estelle and estelle's gentle manners were effective in toning down some of kitty's exuberance peggy was glad to know that in discouraging kitty's attentions she had not alienated her loyal little worshipper for as she thanked the two freshmen for their gift kitty suddenly threw both arms about her neck i don't know how we're going to get along without you exclaimed kitty winking away the tears i know i shall be just awfully homesick when i start school next fall and you're not there and estelle says so too the day before commencement the flowers began to arrive a wise regulation had forbidden the presentation of flowers at the theatre where the graduation exercises were held as in the past the inequalities of fortune had been responsible for many heart burnings but peggy's friends knew her address and flowers poured in on her boxes from the florists flowers picked from suburban gardens while a few clusters brought with them the breath of the woods the vases in the house were overflowing odd pitchers were pressed into service and finally in desperation they fell back on fruit jars as receptacles for the increasing wealth of flowers i declare miss peggy exclaimed sally lumbering to peggy's room with a long florist box under her arm anybody'd suppose this was a funeral occasion oh sally remonstrated peggy and spoiled her protest by laughing what does make you say such things there's no arm in that miss peggy any corpse might be proud of being remembered this way sally stood with her arms akimbo waiting to see the box opened this was her perquisite for climbing the stairs the lifted cover revealed a sheaf of roses of a delicate misty pink and deliciously fragrant sally sniffed ecstatically i declare miss peggy ain't roses the beatenest things for smell except cabbage maybe she added conscientiously peggy did not reply just at that minute she had caught sight of a little note snuggled down among the roses addressed in a hand she knew sally waited expectantly maybe that little letter will tell you who they came from miss peggy tain't likely they're sending you the bill but the doorbell rang at that moment and sally departed with her curiosity unsatisfied even when alone peggy took her time about opening the note her thoughts turned toward the lower drawer in her chiffonier where buried under gloves and ribbons yours devotedly babe awaited resurrection graham wiley's card was enclosed in the small envelope as peggy knew it would be on the reverse side something was written as peggy read it the angry color flooded her cheeks to the sweetest of sweet girl graduates peggy stood looking hard at the carefully written lines of course graham did not mean anything he had always assumed a half-brotherly air toward her he thinks of me as he would of ruth peggy said aloud and even as she spoke she challenged her own words and then there was babe graham should realize that babe made all the difference in the world 
she put the flowers in water after a little the severity of her expression relaxing as she handled them after all it was not their fault poor things and then she tore graham's card into infinitesimal bits and dropped the fragments into the waste-basket when she dressed and started away with priscilla to the opening festivities of commencement day her cheery face betrayed nothing of her inner disquiet peggy blamed herself extravagantly for her feeling of discontent it was outrageous abominable she searched for the strongest adjectives in her vocabulary and hurled them at herself a girl who had everything that heart could wish who was even going to college in the fall a girl who had been fairly submerged by unexpected kindnesses from all sorts of people had no excuse whatever for that feeling of contraction in her throat only an ungrateful heart could own to disappointment on a day like this and then peggy found a shadow of excuse for herself after all there was ground for disappointment when a friend fell short of the standard you set for him and graham had fallen short there was no doubt of that when she came home late in the afternoon she looked tired her mother noticed it and counselled a nap i'll call you in a half hour if you like mother cried peggy reproachfully you don't suppose i'm going to sleep away a whole half hour of my first and only commencement day i wonder at you and she ran upstairs as lightly as if her buoyant young body had never made the acquaintance of weariness half an hour later attired in her commencement frock she viewed herself in her little mirror with that sense of satisfaction which the least vain of girls must feel when she sees herself looking her prettiest peggy examined herself with the air of a complacent robin viewing his spring plumage a very satisfactory piece of work miss raymond though i say it as shouldn't nothing homemadey about that dress as far as i can see peg shouted dick's voice from below somebody to see you peggy jumped from the chair on which she was perched for a better look at herself and ran lightly down the stairs she had hardly seen amy or ruth all day and she had an idea that she would find one or the other waiting for her in the cool living-room as she entered a young man rose from the chair near the window and came quickly toward her why graham wylie surprise made peggy forget that she did not quite approve of graham how did you happen to be here you didn't think i could stay away on your commencement day did you peggy he had both of peggy's hands in his and peggy drew them away quite decidedly it was good of you to remember she said with a girlish dignity that became her very well and thank you so much for the flowers they were beautiful they weren't half beautiful enough for you peggy his intonation was unmistakable peggy blushed high and there was an edge to her voice as she cautioned him don't be silly graham a youth as much in earnest as graham was at that moment is likely to resent such admonitions silly he repeated spiritedly is there anything especially silly in telling the sweetest girl you know that nothing is good enough for her for a moment peggy's heart almost stood still this was so much worse than she had dreamed she steadied her voice with an effort i think graham you had better reserve remarks of that sort for babe what in thunder are you talking about peggy raymond reserve them for whom for babe she repeated and then as he looked at her blankly for yours devotedly babe peggy did not know what answer she expected graham to make but it is certain she was not prepared to have him after a moment's astonished pause burst into laughter while there is no argument in a laugh it nevertheless carries conviction under certain circumstances before graham's paroxysm was over peggy knew there was a mistake somewhere ruth brought over her picture she said faintly and you called her your sweetheart yes i remember graham mopped his wet eyes i meant to have a little fun with ruth and i forgot to explain why you dear little goose babe is jim vincent jim peggy could get no further he's made up for the part of babe hutchins in the little operetta we fellows gave just before the spring vacation makes a dandy girl doesn't he though his feet are something of a giveaway and you thought he was my sweetheart did you peggy that fond caressing tone had come into his voice again peggy did not meet his eye as she answered casually i took your word for it will you take my word for it if i tell you the name of my real sweetheart the dearest girl in all the world she looked away through the window her girlish face sweet and vaguely troubled graham could have touched the little hands folded in her lap without moving from his chair something kept him back peggy dear i know i'm not good enough for you 
but you could make anything of me you liked. Won't you try? Her eyes came back to his face, and the look of anxiety had increased. Graham felt a little puzzled, but he continued in the same strain. You don't know how many temptations a fellow has nowadays, Peggy. It would help to keep me straight, if I knew you were thinking of me, that you loved me. I'm afraid, said Peggy, straightening herself and speaking in a voice calculated to daunt the hopes of an ardent lover, that I must ask to be excused. The change in her was so unmistakable that for a moment Graham stared at her in amazement. Why, Peggy, he remonstrated at length, you don't understand me. I'm afraid I do, Graham. You want me, don't you, to undertake the job of making you into the sort of man I could love? Isn't that it? Why, I, why? How would you like it yourself, Graham, if I said that if you loved me, I could be a good woman, but I couldn't answer for myself without your help? Why, cried Graham, his handsome face aflame, that's different. It seems a good deal alike to me. If I, if I loved anybody, said Peggy with an effort, I would want to feel that he was strong and good of himself without my helping him, you know. They were both silent for a little. I thought, began Graham presently, clearing his throat, that you were always so keen about helping people. Oh, yes, Peggy agreed. People who love each other should help each other, of course. But if I felt that somebody was only good on my account, and would do all kinds of horrid things if it wasn't for me, why then, I might be awfully sorry for him, but I couldn't respect him. Again there was a long silence. Then suddenly Graham left his chair and stood close to her. Peggy Raymond, he said in a ringing voice, you're a brick. Peggy's answer was a choked half-laugh, but no conventional term of endearment could have been as sweet in her ears as that slangy, affectionate title. We men like to call ourselves the stronger sex, Graham continued, and then we come around to you girls and do the baby act, the way I've done to-night. I don't wonder you're ashamed. But listen, Peggy, in the next year or two I'm going to make you proud of me. He stooped, kissed her hands lightly as they lay folded on her lap, and went out of the room without looking back. The theatre in which the commencement exercises were held was crowded that night with the usual intent throng, and fans were waving as always, and there were fathers in broadcloth and fathers with work-roughened hands, brought together by a common ambition and a common pride, as would be possible in no land but our own. And there were the restless little brothers and the painfully good little sisters, who are always on view on such occasions. And, of course, the mothers were there. The orator of the evening, a man from another state, made an address which bore a strong family resemblance to the thousands of commencement addresses, which are made each June to countless graduates. The mayor of the city presented the diplomas, and his brief speech was almost the exact duplicate of what innumerable other mayors were saying, or would say, before the week was over. On the stage the girls waited for the precious bits of parchment, which meant that one goal had been reached. In their white dresses they looked very much alike to the casual spectator, though almost any one in the audience could have pointed out one girl set apart from the others by some unmistakable mark of distinction. A handsome young man, who had accompanied his sister to the exercises, scanned the white-robed girls on the stage for some minutes before he found the only one worth counting, and, when he found her, his heart leaped into so exultant a measure that he almost fancied Ruth would hear it for Peggy was wearing his roses. The End The End of Chapter 20 And the End of Peggy Raymond's School Days or Old Girls Anew by Harriet Lummis Smith Read by Daryl War <laughs>